Have your Bibles open to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. As we continue our series on alcohol in the Bible, or what does the Bible say about drinking? The Bible is our rule for faith and practice. What that means is that we ought to follow the Bible in how we live. Not just when we come to church, but uh, every single day of the week. So we ought to follow the Bible in how we live. All right. Question, do you? <laughs> do you? We ought to, amen. Do you? Uh, of course I do. Of course I do. Uh, the Bible says that God created everything, and I believe in creation. So I follow the Bible. Well, that's good. You just got fast the first verse. And uh, there's 65.9 more books to go through. And so sometimes, all right, and not that it's a problem here at First Baptist Church, but sometimes uh, Christians can be a Christian, trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and not pattern their life after the Bible. They pattern it after the way they think, the way they've been raised. Uh, sometimes it's uh, what they've been taught somewhere else rather than going to Scripture and finding out what Scripture says. And that's kind of the purpose for these studies. In Proverbs chapter number 23, we look at one passage. We'll be around a little bit tonight as we begin now to get in some of the, the details of what the Bible says about alcohol and the Christian. Proverbs 23, if you look in verse number 30, I'm sorry, verse number 29, the Bible says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I will start there tonight. And we'll see how far we get. This will probably take me a few weeks to get through. I want to take the time to give um, the, the seriousness and the time to God's Word that I think we need. I'm going to go through some principles, a paradox, the particulars, and finally some problems. All right, take me a few weeks, and I, will, I want to deal with thoroughly, if I can, this particular topic, this idea, alcohol and the Christian. Let's ask the Lord's help and blessing as we begin tonight. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for all that you have done here at First Baptist Church and that what you're doing right now. Lord, I pray you touch us. Lord, I pray that as we come each service into your house, Lord, that you would meet with us, that we would not only feel your presence, Lord, but that we would be touched by your word, changed by your truth. And Lord, may we not leave farther away from you, but closer to you. Lord, I pray even tonight as I speak about this particular topic, that you would give me the grace and strength that I need. Lord, I've tried to do my part in study, but I need your help. Lord, help me say those things that are true to your word, Lord. Uh, we need your understanding. Without your spirit, these things are foolishness, because these truths are spiritually discerned. So Lord, I pray for your spirit and for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Along the way, I will, I will not give you notes. I will give them to you verbally. At the end, I'll give you a sheet with all the blanks filled in. All right? But along the way, I encourage you to take notes. And if there's something that you don't understand that I'm saying or that you think that I'm not saying correctly, by all means, come and ask me. Uh, last year, we started a text question number. We'll get that, maybe not tonight, if we can tonight, uh, that number back up on the screen. If you have a question along the way, you can text a question to that number. I'll do my best to answer. Thanks, Pastor Milton. Already on it, but a good good man. He's a good, good staff member here. Um, but I'll do my best along the way to answer those questions, not at the night of. So if you think you're going to text a question and I'll get it on my watch or my phone right away, it's not going to happen. All right? So don't keep on sending it thinking I'm ignoring you. All right? I am, but not for that reason. And so I'll look at them. And sometimes uh, when we've done this, we'll have two or three questions that are the same type of question so I can handle it in one particular uh, session. So I'd like to answer your questions. Uh, but as we look at this topic, I want you to understand a couple of things kind of as some foundational truths or some foundation ideas. That one... Um, 
This is not a new problem. This is not a new problem. We'll look at it throughout the study, but Noah, Noah became a husbandman after the flood. He became drunk and he made a terrible mistake in his life. That was a long, long, long time ago. And Noah was called by God a preacher of righteousness. This concept of alcohol is not a new problem, but it is a big deal. Do not succumb to the thought process that it doesn't really matter. Just as long as you don't drink, it doesn't really matter what the Bible says, this or that. It absolutely matters what the Bible says. Right? If the Bible says that I shouldn't do something, then I shouldn't do it. If it says I should, or it doesn't say, then, then I can. This is a big deal. All right? I want to follow the Bible. I want to be careful as I handle the Bible. It is a big deal. And understand that the extreme of this is in direct opposition to be being controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5 tells us, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now, I'll get a little ahead of myself, but people will say, well, that's it. The Bible says just don't get drunk. And it does say that. We'll get, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But understand that in this context, where we're going with this is, ultimately, it's in direct opposition to the control of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life. You know the control of the Holy Spirit is a new thing? Before Jesus came, they didn't have it the same way that we have it. In fact, Jesus says, when I leave, I will give you my comfort. I will put my Holy Spirit upon you. He will speak of me. And we know that happened at Pentecost. That is a new thing. They didn't have the same working in the same way in the Old Testament. Jesus gave us Holy Spirit afterwards, and then he gave us some instructions about that. This is a big deal. It has infiltrated current Christianity. It has infiltrated current Christianity. I'm not just talking about some extremist groups. It's a group of, of people who do this thing they call hymns and hops. Hymns and hops. For those who understand brewing of beer, of which I have learned more in this study, I do not know that naturally, and if you do, shame on you. Unless you're studying this topic. They said, we like to keep it pretty simple. Come and join us as we sing the good news and enjoy a good brew. That's their advertisement, not my synopsis. As we sing the good news and enjoy a good brew. Does that just not on some level inside your spirit just not sound just right? Like that your spirit, the Holy Spirit with your spirit that just says, there's something wrong about that singing the good news and enjoying a good brew. They, those things probably shouldn't go together. It would be like, kind of like, I would, if I were to say this, and I'm not, I am so glad that you are here today. If you're not saved, come forward, trust Jesus Christ, and get a free beer. Sing the good news and enjoy a good brew. Something just doesn't quite seem spiritually right. I'm not in the Bible yet, I'm just saying, here. Are you with me? It's something like, well, this is, it, it's infiltrated, curtain current Christianity. I mentioned this back in, in February. There's a new church in Orlando, not new now. They're called the Castle Church Brewing Community. The first church that is a microbrewery. They describe themselves as Orlando's newest premier destination brewery. And while beer is our passion, as a spiritual community, we exist for people first. I was on their website today. They had three little phrases. Too churchy for your churching buddies? Check out our church. Too drinky for your churching buddies? Check out our beer. Does not something inside of you say, boy, that just doesn't seem to be why Jesus Christ came to earth? As I read the Gospels, the words that Jesus said, I don't hear him talking that way. And if you read the Gospels, then neither will you. Some 
have wine in communion. And they say this is what Jesus commanded us to do. It's not a new problem. We have Baptists. Can I say, in one sense, with a little parenthesis or a little uh, uh, quotation marks, good Baptists, all right? What I mean by that is they come from places that you would know that, that maybe even you have encouraged your kids to go to for schooling. And they come out of these places and they say, you know what, I don't think it's wrong to drink. And they drink. Not just in moderation, in excess. This is not just something that's way far away and like, oh, Pastor, you're, you know, you're crying wolf way over there. And they got up on the screen, submit questions, there you go, 5021526. This is not just something that's way far away, it's around us all of the time. I would be foolish if I did not believe that maybe even some of the First Baptist Church says, well, I don't think it's wrong, and so I'm going to drink a little bit. Now, I hope when we're done with the study that you look at the Bible and say, you know what? The Bible says this. I'm obviously teaching and preaching toward that end. All right? Let me give you the Bible principle. All right? Let me just start there. We're starting the night. That the God teaches the Christian to avoid alcohol as a drink. All right? God teaches the Christian to avoid alcohol as a drink. Can I clean my floors with it? Shut up. You say, Pastor, can you say that at church? Well, I'll come to the altar night afterwards. You ever notice that sometimes it's the, it's the carnal Christians that, that want to ask those, like, those little questions that have no bearing on life? Have no, no, zero bearing. Not the honest questions. I remember it was music before with teenagers. I was youth pastor and principal early on, and uh, sometimes a teenager would come and ask about music. Now, sometimes they come with an honest question, but sometimes they come with the attitude of a carnal Christian. And they, uh, you can see me over there, they come like this in the office. So, Pastor, what's wrong with this? Now, what does that attitude say? Like, come on, come on, Pastor, let, let's talk about this right here, right? Why does it seem like the carnal Christian wants to, wants to bring those odd questions? Not on. There's some honest ones, and we'll look at those. The, but the Bible teaches, God teaches the Christian to avoid alcohol as a drink. Proverbs 23, the verse that we read, the verses we read the night shows us, teaches us, that wine is to be avoided. Some will say, well, just drink a little and you'll be okay. Now we'll deal with that a little bit later on. I'm just trying to talk about some foundational things. Just drink a little bit. In this process of my study, I have read um, countless passages of Scripture and countless articles. I was curious what kind of blogs and ideas are out there from other Christians and pastors. What I have found that there are just a few arguments that people use. All right, And we seem to be, and I said this early on, I'll, I want to repeat this again, we too often are scholars of scholars, not scholars of Scripture. We read something on a blog or from a commentary, and rather than study Scripture, we regurgitate it. We Revomit it back up the same disgusting arguments. I read an interesting article today as I was getting ready for this, this session night, and it said, Alcohol Christians from a young pastor's perspective. I clicked on it. It seemed like clickbait. And I went into it, Dr. Flanders, with a bad attitude. I thought, you know what? I know where this article's going. I've read countless of these articles. There's some young guy, right, Brother Treadway? Let me just tell you, you know, he's going to tell you, let me just tell you why Jesus turned the water into wine, and while, you know, Timothy drank a little wine for the stomach's sake, and let me tell you why I drink a lot of beer. That's where they go. And I, and I had a bad attitude reading this article. I'm thinking, I was, I was cynical, and I started to read, and he caught me off guard. He said, I'm a young pastor. I'm 20, I mean, 23, 24. He said, but I'm against alcohol. And I'm like, and I, you know, I stopped and said, okay, wow. And he, he had my attention. 
I said, I haven't found a lot of these. And uh, boy, he started listing out some arguments, some things that I'm going to bring up. I already had these down, right? Because they're from the Bible. Funny, if you study the Bible, you come to the same conclusion. And, uh, and then he ends... And then he ends with this statement. He said, I believe that from the Bible, he goes, but more importantly, but less importantly, he goes, um, drinking ruined my life. And I was not surprised at the end to find out that his dad was an alcoholic, died when his dad was 40, he said, and left three young men. He said, I'm serving God today, and God, God's against it. He goes, and we shouldn't even touch it. I said, this is good. Publish that thing over and over. But the Bible says in Proverbs 23, we'll go into it a little bit deeper in just a second, but there is some things that people say. They'll say this, well, the Bible only deals with drunkenness. This is typically not an argument, all right, about being drunk. Not, almost no one argues for drunkenness. If they argue for drunkenness, they're just probably not even saved. Honestly, any Christian will say, well, you can't get drunk. The Bible just deals with drunkenness. And while the Bible does deal with drunkenness, that is not all the Bible deals with. It does deal with drunkenness in a multiplicity of places. Some have told, I, I had one Christian tell me this, well, it helps me to relax. Helps me to relax. What is our biblical mandate on how to relax? Or what does the Bible tell us to do when we're stressed out? Yeah, rely on Jesus, right? Find our strength in Him, not something else. I read this article today, another one. This is a lady. Uh, she was a Southern Baptist. And she talked about her journey through this. Her therapist had said, drink a little wine at night, it'll help you relax. And she said her words, that first night I drank and it did. She goes, a problem came when my husband and children came home a few months later and I was passed out on the living room floor. Her story. Helps me to relax, some will say. This one, this one always makes me laugh. There are some really good health benefits. Now I will get to this. Because I want to find out what, what this is about. Really good health benefits. I will not share this because this, this one right here Oh, listen, if, if you come to me and say, Pastor, this is good health benefits, please, just have a seat. All right, just have a seat. We will have this conversation. All right, we will talk through this. It won't so be much so conversation. It'll be like a one-sided thing, okay? It's not so much conversation. We'll look at this in light, and I'll take it in light of current medicine, information with secular websites. You want to talk about current health benefits, I will give you what the secular medical professionals say about this. All right, and then we'll have that discussion. But they say, oh no, it's good for your heart. But we'll talk about that. Or one more argument that I came across. People, people. Here it is. God made everything so everything is good. There's not enough time. There's not enough time to begin to just begin with this person who says this. It, an article, I mean, these are arguments that I have found, all right? That, that every, <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, God created heaven and the earth. But last time I checked, two chapters in, sin entered the world. And at that point, man has been on a mission to ruin everything and to, uh, to hurt everything God has created. Last time I checked, God made everything. Yes. God made everything. Man in his depravity, his sinfulness, his corruption seeks to find things to bring his own benefit. <laughs> Let me give you this, the first point tonight, the paradox in Scripture concerning wine. The problem comes because there's an apparent, or there's a paradox, which is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Let me give you an example of some paradoxes. All right, this is a paradox. In life, if you say you have to spend money to make money, that's a paradox. It doesn't seem to add up. How would I spend money and make to make money? Or deep, deep down, deep down, you are really shallow. It's a paradox. The Bible has some paradoxes in it right now. 
In fact, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger. Right? Then in John chapter 6, he says, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. Paul says in Galatians, to be not yoked in bondage. Jesus says, come unto me and take my yoke upon you. All right, the Bible at times has a paradox or something that appears at first glance to contradict itself. But upon further study, all right, the truth becomes apparent. That's why we began last year and last week with this thought, study to show thyself approved unto God. All right, sometimes you got to jump in a little bit deeper. The paradox is this, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The Bible says if you're deceived by it, by wine and strong drink, then you're a fool. God is against it. The whole book of Proverbs, beginning to end, has the theme of wisdom running throughout it. Does it not? From chapter 1 to the end, wisdom. Wisdom. And it tells me that if I'm deceived by wine or strong drink that I'm not wise, spending chapter after chapter challenging me to run to wisdom. And says, this is one way to miss wisdom. Yet, in Psalms, the Bible says, He, God, causeth the grass to grow. He causes herb for the service of man, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man. You see, in one sense, Wine has the unreserved condemnation of God. And in another passage, the total unreserved blessing of God. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So how can the same Bible seem to contradict itself? We have to ask ourselves a couple questions. One, does God contradict himself yes or no no and God is not the author of confusion all right so we know that if there's a contradiction it cannot be with God all right that God is not a contradiction is there second question is there a mistake in Scripture okay we'll try that one again is there a mistake in Scripture absolutely not you know, did, did some teetoler get in there and start to just edit or did some, uh, some drunkenness get in there, wine beverage get in there? No, 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 I don't think so, not at all. We have the preserved Word of God. Amen? So if there appears to be a contradiction, the problem must be from my lack of understanding and knowledge and not with God or the Bible. All right, so if there if there's uh, appears to be a contradiction, the problem must be with me, all right, and not with him. All right, we clear on that. So the paradox, there is a paradox there, and that's why there's some discussion back and forth about it. That's why God, men and women and Christians will kind of argue about it. I've had some discussions with people, and sometimes people are not well-versed in this. They haven't studied. They just talk. Just talk, 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 talk. Let's talk about the Bible. So let me talk about some the particulars of Scripture about wine. Let's dig into some things right here. All right, understand this. Scripture speaks about wine. There are 19 words in the Bible used to describe wine, and there's six main words. All right, 19 different words used wine, alcohol, drunk, drunkenness, six main words used throughout Scripture. Things like King said unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? Jesus in Luke chapter 5, but new wine must be put in the bottles, both are preserved. As I did my study, I went through and I marked the way that I believe them to be used. One, if they're used negatively. All right, and I marked those in my notes in red. Why? Well, red just seems bad. All right, so I made in my notes red to be bad. Second way they're, they're sometimes used is neutral. Neutral meaning that just describing something, just illustrating something, something just happened, or you're going to do this, you're going to go to the, the land that flows with milk and honey, and you'll have wine, and, and it's just like just describing something. Sometimes they're used in an offering. An offering. Other times they're used in prophecy. And lastly, I put down times they were used good or positively. 
So of these six main words, of these six main words, they're used, oh, about 231 occasions in the Bible. All right, I knew you wanted to know that. Just to paint a perspective for you, so I did my study. There are 783,137 words in the Bible. I did not count them. <laughs> I did not. I used someone else for that data. So there could be 783,138 words, but I believe there's 783,137. And if you want to count, that's fine. Or, or about three-tenths of one percent is the topic of wine in the Bible. So beginning of it, he starts to give the description of someone who is probably intoxicated, right? Can we agree on that? Probably intoxicated. But then he goes right to wine, mixed wine, enhanced wine, and wine that causes any flushing. Like your cheeks to turn red, nose to turn red. What would you think, what kind of wine do you think that would be? Grape juice or some with an alcohol content? Come on now. You're... You know this, it's not, a hard, it's not, 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 not rocket science, right? He then goes on to say what this does, all right, before. All right, he says to avoid this. So he talks about somebody who's drunk, and then Terry Long, and then he says, don't look upon it in these ways, so avoid it right in the middle. See how he encapsulated it with avoiding it. And then he says, these are results if you don't avoid it. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, and it stingeth like an adder. In reality and figuratively, you get burned by alcoholic beverage. In reality and figuratively, you get burned by alcoholic beverage. It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. He says, If you don't avoid this, it will remove your morals. Eyes will behold strange women, remove your morals. Your heart shall utter perverse things. You will have no control over what you say. Now we know these things to be true from maybe experience or watching someone. But the Bible said this a whole long time ago. He goes on. He says that uh, you shall, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now that's interesting. He says, if you don't avoid alcohol, you'll be like someone who's on a boat who's seasick. Excuse me, sir, please step out of your vehicle. Would you please walk this line? Unsteady, like on the top of a mast of a boat, right? The Bible says. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. You'll be sick. You'll throw up. They have beaten me and I have felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You'll feel awful. And at the very end, there's a warning. And he says, if you don't avoid it, you will seek it yet again. It's addictive. All in Proverbs chapter 23. Now, we could stand up here for the next 30 minutes and give real-life illustrations of that, right? And some of you could get up there, right? Some of you could get up and listen, God gave me victory. Thank God I'm free. Right? But there's other Christians who are like, ah, well, you know what? That's only if you're drunk. No, the Bible says do not seek it. All right? Look thou not upon it. All right? Now, I understand the drunk part, but if I'm not supposed to look upon it, Help me here. How can I drink it if I'm not supposed to look at it? So maybe I should alter my Bible principle, Brother Treadway, and say the Bible says don't look upon beer. Don't look upon alcohol beverage. Forget the drunken part. You'll seek it yet again. Don't forget Proverbs 36, 11, or 26, 11. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Wine is deceitful. We mentioned that one, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong wick is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Beyond that, the Bible tells us in Habakkuk chapter 2, 15, that we're not to give wine to our neighbors. Woe unto him 
that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's Habakkuk 2, verse 15. Now help me here. I'm going to jump ahead of myself, and I'm almost done tonight. I'm not going to get, obviously, through all of this. If Jesus turned water into alcoholic wine, if he did that, and Habakkuk says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, then Jesus would have violated Habakkuk 2.15, making him to be sinful so he could not be sin for us. Right? Jesus cannot violate Scripture, and he did not violate Scripture. Habakkuk says, Woe to him that does this. The Bible says that if I love wine, then I'll be poor. Proverbs 21, 17, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Hmm. Romans 13, verse 13, Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, this scripture clearly communicates negativity about wine. And I have to stop tonight because I'm going to next, where I pick up next week, is the examples. The examples of negativity about wine. And not only does the Bible talk with some clear verses, then the Bible gives us some stories of where it's not good. But time is away from us tonight. And I want to do due diligence to this. If you have a question along the way, please, 5021526. Some of you may have questions already. Just hold on, I may get there. All right, I've got a lot of notes to go, a lot of passages to work through, trying to give us the, the time we need. Um, but I, I want to help us, Lord willing, obey the Lord and avoid alcohol as a beverage for a Christian. All right, so we please the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, help us to please you. Lord, may we be students of your scripture. Lord, not just what we hear. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.